Whatever way you look at this car, it's lovely. It just does everything beautifully. Don't think this is a girl, I think it's a man. It's not terribly easy to drive. It's just under two and a half ton. The beauty of these motor cars is that they are forever. They don't make them like this anymore. Frederick Henry Royce was born in 1863, the son of a miller who fell on hard times. At 10, the boy started work as a newspaper seller. After a variety of jobs in mechanical and electrical engineering, he formed F.H. Royce and Company in 1884. And gradually the business progressed, and by the turn of the century, they were prospering. And so he looked into the burgeoning world of motor manufacturing. He made three little two-cylinder Royce cars. They had the name Royce on it, and they had flat radiators. Now, there was another gentleman down in London, the Honorable Charles Stuart Rolls. Now, he was a man of totally different dimensions from Henry Royce. He was a young aristocrat, uh, Eton, Cambridge, and he was looking for motor cars to sell which were made in Britain. He was very anxious to have a motor car, and preferably one which had his name on it. The aristocrat and the burgeoning, the working man, they just immediately had a sympathetic approach to each other, and it was agreed that Henry would make them and Charlie would sell them. So Henry went so far as to build, would you believe, first of all, a three-cylinder motor car, then a four-cylinder car, which was tremendously successful, and this was followed by a 30-horsepower six-cylinder car. Uh, but it was subject to a certain amount of, uh, of crankshaft vibration, and Henry was not satisfied. So in 1906, he devoted himself entirely to the production of this remarkable motor car, the 4050 Rolls-Royce. To publicize the car, Claude Johnson, who became the company's first commercial director, had the body of the 13th car made of aluminium and the fittings silver plated. Hence the name, the Silver Ghost. Well, I was a student and uh, quite an enthusiast for cars. I was only 19 and um, uh, two friends and I saw this car advertised in motorsport and um, we got it going in 1949. And um, I was lucky enough just, just to keep it. I always had somewhere to put it. And, I love it. There's no petrol pump, so you have to get air pressure into the petrol tank to push the petrol along the pipe to the carburetor. And this is done by, first of all, turning on a valve into the pump position, and then pumping up pressure, which can be, depending how full the tank is, up to about a dozen times by hand. And then you have to go around to the other side of the car, lift the bonnet, and there's no choke as such. The mixture wouldn't be rich enough to start you put a, a coin under the low-speed jet. This is something that was never described in the instruction book, but all the old chauffeurs used to know this. And then, with that extra rich mixture set up on the carburetor, turn the engine over eight times, eight times, make sure that every cylinder is charged with mixture. And then, back to the controls, probably taking the coin out at this stage, and switching the ignition on, fully retarded, and then with luck, the engine will start. There is a special type of coil fitted on these early cars called a trembler coil, which provides a continuous stream of sparks. If the engine is in the firing position, it will kick itself off like a steam engine. Once it's running, 
uh, you then move the controls to give a reasonable tick over, advance the ignition, and uh, we're ready to go. It's difficult, with hindsight, to realise that in 1906, Rolls-Royce wasn't really very well known. And they did all sorts of things to um, try and get publicity, going from London to Edinburgh in Top Gear, for example, on one of the early ghosts, and then doing, in the same car, um, a speed of 78 miles an hour at Brooklands. It seems strange that these speed events were something they wanted to do. It doesn't in the Rolls-Royce image anymore, but it brought the name in front of the public. It doesn't have a huge performance. Uh, it's not a sports car. Uh, it's not terribly easy to drive in some ways, the gear change is not easy, but it just does everything beautifully. And they're so reliable, they were so beautifully made, that um, mechanical failure is very, very rare on them. So they were outstanding at the time, there's no question about it. They, um, they were quite different from any other, smoother, quieter and, and better made, and that's how they got the reputation of being the best car in the world. The very early cars didn't have mascots at all, but I think it became popular to have a mascot on your radiator, and Royce didn't like the fact that people could fit rather heavy, cumbersome things on the front, so he commissioned Charles Sykes, who was a sculptor, to sculpt the, uh, the flying lady. I don't believe my car ever had one. I mean, children come up sometimes and say, it can't be a Rolls Royce, it hasn't got the flying lady on the front. Uh, but there we are. I don't think I should bother to have one now. The girl called Eleanor Thornton was used almost certainly as the model for what became known as the spirit of ecstasy. And it does depict the figure of a young woman, arms outstretched, with a mass of tulle wafting in the breeze. And it just encapsulates what Rolls-Royce motoring was all about. In 1914, the Silver Ghost went to war. Its luxurious body was replaced by armour plate. Some of the armoured Silver Ghosts were still in service in the Middle East at the start of World War II. Rolls was a very good salesman, but at the same time a man of immense imaginative powers. He was trying to persuade Henry Royce to build aero engines around 1908. And Henry was saying, well, what is the point of my building aero engines when they aren't aeroplanes? But he was also mad keen on ballooning and aeronautics generally. And he went out to America and he met the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers took him flying and from then on he became absolutely obsessed with flying and his interest in Rolls-Royce motors waned steadily from that moment onwards in a competition to see how close you could get to land on a white mark on the ground. Uh, the plane crashed and he died, the first Englishman to be killed in an aircraft accident. Charlie Rolls tragic death traumatized Royce um, to an extraordinary degree. He looked upon this young man almost as a brother. In 1924, um, Henry really decided that the end of the road had come for the ghost. And so he produced what became known as the new Phantom, the Phantom One. This is a 1937 Phantom III Rolls-Royce with coach work by Freestone and Webb. Right from the start, we called him Sir George, but in fact, we've got onto such friendly terms now that he's just called George. Most people uh, give their cars girls' names. Somehow or other, I don't think this is a girl. I think it's a man. Uh, he's not really capricious, you know. He's very um, reliable, straightforward, robust, quite macho, really, you know. Uh, most of the time, very quiet and smooth. If you put your foot down, you really feel the muscles coming through. An archetypal English gentleman. It's curious that after the Depression, there was a, 
an increase in demand of super luxury motor cars. It was a time when people were still uh, building cars regardless of cost. And although £2,500 or so, which is what this car would have cost in 1937, doesn't sound like a lot of money, it was a hell of a lot of money then. Probably the equivalent of about £300,000 in um, present day money. It's remarkably easy to drive in um, modern traffic, unlike a lot of pre-war cars. There's lots of power there. The car pulls away comfortably on um, level ground in third gear. It's almost like driving an automatic. The brakes are servo-assisted, so, and the steering, despite the weight of the car, which is two and a half tons or thereabouts, because you've got a big wheel, it's remarkably light. When Henry Royce died with Wittering in 1933, his life having been prolonged for many years by the faithful nurse Orbin, his design team, who'd been, of course, stationed with him at West Wittering for many years, uh, reverted to Derby, to the main factory. Um, the mantle of power then fell on Ernest Hives. He was, of course, the man who had realized that the imposition of war was absolute and that he was going to produce vast quantities of this wonderful engine, the Merlin engine, which, of course, won the Battle of Britain and powered so many British and Allied fighter and bomber aircraft. The development testing of Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars is more rigorous and thorough than that of any other car manufacturer in the world as in this example, where an engine is being subjected for night after night to 29 degrees of frost in order to confirm that it will start with ease every morning. After the Second World War, um, the production of motor cars was transferred from Derby to Crewe. They had realized that to continue to build Rolls-Royce motor cars and Bentley motor cars as they were built before the war would be an impossibility. The war brought an entirely new um, image of the working man. He was no longer prepared to work 10 hour days at one and six an hour. Royce, of course, himself was meticulous in his own records, and we have a copy of his uh, records for the very first two-cylinder engine. Each car, when it was ordered, a card was made up of the, uh, the customer's requirements, and uh, we still have them all listed here. Practically every famous person in the world has had a Rolls-Royce, um, from people like Kipling and Frank Sinatra, Cassius Clay, uh, many royals, crown heads of Europe, uh, Franco had several. Uh, the, the list is just endless. By keeping records of owners and the, every time the car changed hands, they could do a really personal service, not to be expected by a car manufacturer, but they really did look after their customers. And so that the owner shall not be inconvenienced, he's driven to his home in another car by one of the service station chauffeurs. This motor car is a Silver Cloud 3, long wheelbase limousine with a division. Now the division is with a glass partition that goes between the passenger and the driver. I first fell in love with the Rolls Royce when a boy, and this was during the war. And I always said then that this is one of the cars that I shall love to own one of these days when I've got enough money. So I had to save and save and save. I never thought I'd have sufficient money. 
And one day when I was much older, years older, in the evening news, there was this particular motor car for sale. And they wanted six and a half thousand pounds. Now for me, six and a half thousand pounds meant a lifetime of saving. And it was the biggest wrench of my life. I've had this now for 23 years. The engine's never been touched, only for general maintenance, changing of oil, filter, which I've always done myself. Well, the engine size is six and a quarter litre, which is a very large engine, but then it's got to take a very large body. This particular motor car as well does 18 to the gallon, providing you keep your foot steady at approximately 65 mile an hour. Modern day cars have got power steering. This is power assisted steering, which enables you to pull the wheels around because it's a very heavy old car. It's just under two and a half ton. But this particular motor car, I don't take a tool kit in anywhere I've been. And I've just come back from Sweden in it on a road rally. And we've been to Salzburg, we've been to Berlin when the war was up. We've got, had to go through the corridor. We've had all the police look at it, all the communists look at it. And that makes me proud to be English. Well, my son went to the uh, Rolls Royce School uh, of chauffeuring, and I've always been known as Little Legs. And I have to use a cushion under my behind. And when I sit in the back with my big cigar on, <laughs> they go, oh, here he comes again. <laughs> and my son is six foot tall. I said, he makes me look as if I'm about uh, three foot tall. But then when I'm sitting in the back of this, I'm 10 feet tall. It's such a shame that uh, they don't make them like this anymore. The Rolls Royce of today is more like a square box. They've got no lovely lines like they used to have because this is the last of the real Rolls Royce because it's got nice lines, it's round. Everything, whatever way you look at this car, is lovely. And I've only ever liked old things. That's why I told my wife I'll always keep her. Here, Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars are made with only one consideration, perfection. Here, the spirit of Sir Henry Royce is very much in evidence in the building of individual cars for individual people, with the accent on individual craftsmanship. Still, they went down to Sorrento to have the walnut trees cut and recut in order to get the superb veneer that went into the woodwork. They traipsed around Denmark and Sweden to find cow hides that had not been penetrated by, by barbed wire. They went, as they do to this very moment, to endless lengths to achieve what they have continued to strive for, the pursuit of excellence. Rolls-Royce, not surprisingly, have consistently marketed themselves with, through very glamorous catalogues, with parchment covers, with onion skin insets, with very lavish illustrations. One suspects it was always difficult to get a Rolls-Royce brochure. It had to be almost a private order. Because, of course, most of them, or indeed all of them until the 50s, were coach-built, the body of the brochure had very, very lavish technical information, and the body styles were generally a series of pictures tucked in the back, perhaps, or mounted on separate sheets. After the 50s, the advertising material ceases to emphasise engineering excellence and originality. What you do get is interior shots of the leather, the walnut, the features that had become traditionally Rolls-Royce areas. And increasingly, as the 70s and 80s went on, you were emphasising just this luxury element, just this prestige element, and there was no suggestion, perhaps, that you were buying anything extraordinary mechanically or technically. 
We'd made the very successful Silver Shadow for some 15 years until the end of the 1970s. But the time had come then, following our evolutionary approach, to move on to a new shape. But it was, whilst it being a considerable change, it was not a dramatic change. It was very much following that evolutionary process. So the Silver Spirit series, of which the Silver Spirit is a long wheelbase variant, evolved from the Silver Shadow series. I would imagine that the first sensations that anybody feels when they drive the car are more emotional ones. They think about its size and they think about its value. Once you've got used to that and put that out of your mind, it's actually a very easy car to drive, a very enjoyable car to drive. Um, most of the systems on it are fully automatic, so all you have to do is actually helm the thing, which is a very enjoyable experience, and uh, especially when you're uh, driving long distances. It's great to sit back and enjoy the calmness of the motoring. When people see this car, they want to have a look at it. They're interested to see who might be driving it. They admire the fact that it's a car that they know has cost a lot of money and a lot of people's time and effort to make. But it's, so it's not unusual for somebody to say, well, after you at, at a road junction or to, uh, to make sure you get the best space in front of the hotel when you come to park. The people who buy Rolls-Royce and Bentley motor cars are by their nature individual. Obviously, a common denominator amongst them is the wherewithal, uh, the, the cash to buy the car in the first place. On average, they will own something like four or five other luxury cars in their portfolio. Um, so they'll probably have, as well as their Rolls-Royce or their Bentley, they'll have either a Mercedes or a BMW. They'll probably have um, a four-wheel drive, perhaps, for towing their boat or their horses. They'll probably have something small and exciting to scare the living daylights out of themselves <clears throat> on the occasional weekend um, drive in the country. So they'll have different cars for different purposes. Rolls-Royce of today is very much a contemporary motor car, as it has to be. We wouldn't have survived without always changing with the times. But it is very much the, the um, descendant of the proud Silver Ghost, and, it, and I think it would rightfully carry still the name that the Silver Ghost earned for us all those years ago of being the best car in the world. Well, of course, the great name, the best car in the world, was formulated by a very eulogistic motoring correspondent in 1910. I think at the time it was undoubtedly justifiable, but it was a sobriquet which has caught the imagination of the world. You never hear anybody talking about my washing machine runs like a Mercedes Benz. It's always my washing machine runs like a Rolls Royce. It is the Rolls Royce. In fact, there was um, a red lighthouse in Paris which had over the top the Rolls Royce of pleasure. I may say Rolls Royce rapidly had that removed, but what I'm saying is that the name has become in itself a measure of excellence.